throughout the Hyksos, the Asiatic invaders who ruled Egypt, between the Middle and New Kingdoms. Thus, thus Ammon became the most important god of Egypt, and soon of the empire which came afterwards. He was considered as the king of gods. But now it's only grown in some special plantations. This papyrus. The lunar god in the form of a man with the head of the ibis bird, holding the pen and the scribe's ink palette. Tahat is referred to as the inventor of the hieroglyphic writing, lord of wisdom and magic. Osiris was one of the most important gods of the Egyptians. They believed that he was a very popular king and beloved of his subjects, which made his brother Seth very jealous of him. Seth murdered his brother Osiris and tore his body into 14 pieces and scattered them throughout Egypt. Isis, the faithful wife of Osiris, searched for the pieces of his body and then used the greatest of her magic spells to bring Osiris back to life. And then she conceived of him her child Horus. Where are... Here we can see the goddess Isis with her son Horus on her knee. After the departure of her husband to a new life in the other world, Isis brought up her son in the sheltered marches of the delta covered with papyrus. Isis was more popular than any other goddess because she typified the faithful wife and the devoted mother. And this scene nowadays represents the symbol of motherhood in modern Egypt. Horus. There were several falcon gods in Egypt, but the most famous is the god Horus. In his earliest form, he was the god of aerial space with the sun and moon as his two eyes. In the legend of Osiris, Horus was the heir to his father's kingdom, which had been stolen from him by his wicked uncle Seth. Afterwards, Horus was able to take his heir back, and Horus nowadays represents the badge of Egypt Airlines, as he was the god of aerial space in ancient Egypt. Kenom. Kenom is represented as a man with a ram's head, he was the giver of life who created men out of clay on his potter's wheel. He was also the god of Aswan and the guardian of the sources of the Nile. Yeah. Egypt is the gift of the Nile, and here we can see Happy, god of the Nile was usually shown as a strong bearded man with female breasts as a sign of fertility and a large stomach as a sign of nourishment. As god of the Nile, he is crowned with aquatic plants and holds a tray of fruit. His flesh is colored green like the flood water and he's naked and long-haired like a fisherman in the marshes. At the feet of the statue there is a nilometer, a gauge for measuring the height of the water at the peak of the annual flood with this gauge, they were able to know the prosperity or poverty of Egypt according to the level of water. The god of the ancient capital city of Memphis, he was represented in human form, tightly wrapped in a robe like a mummy. As well as protecting the pharaohs, Sah was the inventor of crafts. Sekhmet. Sekhmet, whose name means the powerful, had the head of a lioness. Her principal center of worship was Memphis, where she was regarded as the consort of Ptah. This bloodthirsty goddess was considered responsible for epidemics and other disasters. That's why she was given the head of a Linus. However, she was also the goddess of medicine, and the priest of Sekhmet formed one of the oldest associations of doctors and surgeons. Imhotep. Imhotep was the chief minister of King Zosar of the Third Dynasty. He was famous as a writer, as a doctor, and as a scholar, who studied astronomy and architecture. He is most famous nowadays for being the architect of the oldest pyramid in Egypt, the Step Pyramid of King Zoser at Saqqara. Now we are 
approaching the entrance of the royal palace, and we can see one of the Vero's family discovering the child Moses. His mother had put him in a basket and floated him on the Nile to prevent him from being killed by the Pharaoh's soldiers. His sister is watching from a distance to see who will find him. Moses was brought up in the Egyptian royal family and eventually he became the prophet and led his people out of Egypt. And lastly we have Beth. Beth was represented as a dwarf with a shaggy beard. Sometimes he wore a crown of tall feathers. Beth God was a great favorite because he protected people against snakes, scorpions, and evil spirits. He was also one of the gods who protected women in childbirth from any harmful happening in mud hives in ancient Egypt. As sugar cane was not grown in Egypt then, honey was used for sweetening the food instead of sugar. Plowing is the first operation in preparing the land for cultivation. Here we can see the plowman with his team and the simple wooden plow. After plowing, the clods of heavy soil are broken up with a hoe, and then a mattock is used to make furrows in straight lines. After the land has been prepared, we can see the farmer hanging the bag of seed around his neck and scattering the, the seed with his hand, the sheep following him to press the seed into the tough soil with their feet. bucket at one end and a heavy counterweight at the other. <laughs> when harvest time comes, the sheaves are then carried to the threshing floor. So after a thick layer of grain has been spread, the cows are driven around it to separate the grain from the ears with their heavy feet. to winnowing, the man throws some grain into the air, the grain falls to the ground, while the much lighter chaff is carried away by the wind. The grain is then taken to be stored in the silos. Steps lead off to the opening at the top, through which the grain is poured, and the scribe is recording the amount of grain being stored. Behind the scribe we can see a pigeon tower. Pigeon world for food and also for carrying messages. And here we have a boat construction. Small boats were usually made of bundles of papyrus tied together with ropes. Such boats were only used for short journeys. Large boats were made of wood, and because the Egyptians did not use metal nails, wooden boats were packed with wooden dowels and sticked together with ropes. <laughs> Fish was plentiful in the Nile and its canals. It was for food. Fishing also was a very popular sport. And here we can see two men standing on two opposite boats where a net is stretched between them. And now we can see how many fish are there. Bad luck as usual. <laughs> and now we came to the industrial section. have an idea about brick making. The building material is the Nile mud, which is mixed with water and chopped straw into a thick paste. This paste is put in a wooden mold and the bricks are then left to dry in the sun. Okay. And on the right we can see the difference between the ancient brick and the modern one. Now 
brick construction. The ancient method of brick construction was to place the bricks first on the broad side and then on the narrow side, as the man is doing. The modern method is to place all the bricks on the broad side. The roof is made of half-pound trunks covered with branches and then covered with mud. Here we have straw, which helps the finished pot to dry without cracking. The potter forms the pot with his fingers as he kicks the wheel round with his foot. And now he's making a teapot. Then the pot is to be dried in the sun and then put in the oven to be fired. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Painting and carving on walls. Here we can see how the ancient Egyptians used to decorate a wall. First of all, the rough surface of the wall is leveled, then it is smoothed and polished by rubbing it with a piece of hard stone. Straight lines are drawn in red on the prepared surface to ensure accurate drawings. The outline of the design is then drawn on the wall, working from the sketch made by the chief artist on a small panel. After that, the design is then carved in relief as in the last panel. carving. It is supposed to take place in a quarry. First of all, the block of stone is cut away from the rock face. This is done by hammering wedges of dry wood into holes bored in the rock. The wedges are soaked with water, and as the wood expands, it causes the rock to crack, and so the block is separated from the quarry. The block is then leveled and polished. The profile of the work is outlined on one side, then the statue is carved, and at last comes the process of rounding it off. The carpenter's workshop. The tools of the carpenter and joiner were made of either copper or bronze. First we can see a man throwing a lug of wood into planks. Other carpenters are using a hammer, chisel and an axe. While the man on the right is using a bow drill to bore holes in a piece of wood. Textile in general use in those days, bundles of flax stalks are first 
pulled through a large wooden comb to remove the tops and leaves. Then the stalks are put in water for a few days to soften them, after which they are beaten with a wooden mallet. Next, the stalks are pulled through a smaller comb to separate the fibers from the outer covering. The good fibers are picked out and spun into thread on a spindle. The fine linen threads are weaved into cloth on a loom. Now we shall see how the papyrus was made. The lowest part of the stalk is the best part, the outer green cover is peeled off, and the white pith is put in a pool of water. Next, the pith is sliced into thin strips, and then it is put in water again. The strips are then placed on a piece of cloth in two layers, one horizontal and the other vertical. The surface of the sheet which is formed is then hammered with a wooden mallet to cause the fibers of the two layers to stick together. When the sheet has been thoroughly beaten, it is covered with another piece of cloth and pressed between two heavy stones for several days. And here we can see the piece of paper which is ready for use. But not the least, this scene shows wine making. <laughs> the bunches of ripe grapes are taken in baskets to the weight. The weights are built of hard stone, such as granite or basalt, so as not to give any aftertaste to the wine. When the weight is full, several men treat out the grapes while holding firmly to the ropes to keep their balance on the slippery surface. The juice is then poured into large pottery jars to ferment. When this process is complete, the jars are sealed with a clay seal stamped with the date and name of the vineyard. By this leads in hope to continue the rest on foot. Thank you. Long flag poles with bright colored flags. The walls are decorated with cock reliefs showing the pharaoh smiting his enemies. Still shows some more of this village. Very interesting. We're in a temple right now to Hathor. And the god Amun. And the scribe with all the papyrus behind him. And here we get the four canopy jars. And a mummy and his tummy is open. Would you say he had mummy's tummy? And the club cedra, the water clock. And a representative of the Battle of Kadesh for Ramses II. And they even have Prince Aleppo, who tried to bring him back to life after he drowned in the river by holding him upside down. A depiction of some of the natives in ancient Egypt. That'd be a rough pillow.
And this is the kitchen. Operating the fire drill. And grinding grain. And here we have the grain leaf. Stubborn. Thank you. Now you look at the camera. <laughs> 